My name is Francesca Purcell, and I'm senior lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And uh, I want to welcome you all to Education Now. Uh, this is a series that the Ed School puts on, and our hope is to provide uh, actionable insights and strategies to help shape new approaches to challenges in education. Uh, what will happen is that over the next 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I'll be having a discussion with our panelists. And then uh, throughout that time, I would invite you to uh, submit any questions you may have using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and then also at the bottom of the screen, excuse me, the Zoom screen, you will find closed caption access there. So uh, without further ado, let me welcome our guests. Uh, we have Peter Blair. Peter is Assistant Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and Peter is also the co-director uh, of the Project on Workforce. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, friend. Uh, we also have with us Clayton Spencer. Clayton is President Emerita of Bates College in Maine. Welcome uh, jo to joining us, Clayton. Thank you. Great to be here. And we have Michelle Weiss. Michelle is the author of the book, Long Life Learning, Preparing for Jobs That Don't Even Exist Yet. Uh, and she is also the leader of the advisory service, Rise and Design. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Fran. Thanks for having me. Great. So glad to have you all here and looking forward to this conversation. So listen, we are going to just jump right into this big topic here. And Clayton, I want to start with you, uh, because when you were at Bates, uh, the college partnered with Gallup to conduct a national survey of college graduates of various ages and stages in their careers. And part of the survey, you found that 80% of college grads thought it was important to enjoy a sense of purpose from their work, but less than half actually felt successful at finding purposeful work. So like, just, can you take us through that and unpack those sure. findings about purposeful work and what's happening here? Sure. Um, well, we were working on a design project that extended for five years at Bates to rethink the way we prepare students to bridge from college and career. And um, we decided we better test some of the assumptions in it. So we partnered with Gallup, not only because it's a, it's a you know, well-known, well-respected polling firm, but because they'd been working on measures of well-being since the mid 20th century. So purpose or career well-being, Gallup uses those interchangeably. We would not at Bates, we would sort of stick with purpose for reasons I can explain. Um, and they had five measures of well-being, purpose well-being, social well-being, financial well-being, community well-being, and physical well-being. But Gallup had never looked in a focused way at how people seek, whether people seek and how they find purpose in work. So that's what that's the study you were referring to. We teamed up with them in 2018. And I'm just going to give you three top line findings. One is purpose turns out to be a big deal in how people think about the work they want and how they think about how they are experiencing their work. You already mentioned this was a Likert scale for those in the audience who um, know about surveys. Um, for others, it's basically a set of questions that was put to a national panel, not just liberal arts colleges like Bates, of college graduates who've been to every kind of college, and they might be in their 20s, they might be in their 70s. And the question was put, um, is purpose important to you? And it turns out 80% of the respondents said it was either very important or extremely important. And the highest single category was extremely important to find purpose in work. And yet 50% found they didn't find it. So then you have to say, well, how do you find it? So this is the next um, headline, which is finding purpose in work um, and in other areas begins with understanding yourself and what matters to you. Because if you can't figure that out, it's going to be hard to know what experiences are going to give you your own authentic 
grounded sense of meaning. So the, the survey also found that um, graduates who align their work with their interests, strengths, and values. Now, this seems intuitive, but a lot of people don't do it. They just say, I want to go earn as much money as I can, or I want something prestigious. But if they align it with their interests, strengths, and values, they are three times more likely to experience high purpose and work. And in order to align it with your strengths and values, you have to know what those are. So you have to start with very um, deliberate processes of self self reflection and discernment, and what we found is that that those who found high purpose in work were those who actually did were reflective and had conscious processes for figuring out what they wanted to do before they went and started looking through binders in a career office. So number one, purpose is hugely important. Number two, it starts with understanding who you are and figuring out how to align that with what you do. And number three, there is a very high correlation between having purpose in work and finding overall well-being. And I think this is a particularly important finding in this era where we are very concerned about the mental health and well-being of basically all, I mean, it's a global phenomenon, but certainly all students for those of us in the education world. And what we discovered in the study was that graduates with high purpose in work are 10 times more likely to have higher overall well being than graduates with low purpose in work. So those are the three three of the big findings that I'll, that I'll highlight. And just so that we can pass the baton to the other um, panelists, um, I will say that I hope we'll have a chance to come back and talk about how we built those insights, which we derived first and then tested in the Gallup poll, how we developed those into a very structured program about how we work with students on finding purpose in their choices while at college and also out into the postgraduate years. Great. Thanks, Clayton. Thanks for saying that, but I'm I'm quite sure we're going to come back because I really want to hear about that. So, Michelle, let me let me now um, uh, bring it over to you. I mean, you really think about and write about the future of work um, and how over a lifetime uh, individuals can be prepared for that. Tell us Tell us more about that work you're thinking as you're listening to Clayton. What are some of the major sort of thoughts that, that come to you in this area? Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just recovering from some sickness, so my voice is not 100%. Um, uh, as I was thinking about what, what Clayton was talking about um, and how it connects with the work that I do, um, I've been sort of fascinated by a lot of these future of work conversations, even uh, as they were rising before the pandemic, and found it interesting that we were so focused on sort of the what, uh, the automation of millions of jobs into obsolescence. We were kind of fixated on how many millions of jobs might be at risk of computerization. And what I found was kind of more helpful for a more constructive approach to designing sort of a future of education to meet the future of work was one where if we actually kind of embrace this idea that, okay, workers are actually, uh, we're all sort of extending our lifespans for longer than we had anticipated. We're staying in the workforce for far longer than we had anticipated. And even some of our Older generations of workers are retiring with an average of 12 job changes by the time they retire. So for the rest of us, that means we could be facing maybe 20 or 30 job changes to come in this more turbulent, uncertain world of work. And so when we think about how hard it is just to navigate one single job change, what is it that we can do to begin designing a better ecosystem for the future? And what it comes down to is designing for the who. And so what I started to look at prior to the pandemic were the people who were already kind of falling through the cracks of our education and workforce infrastructure. And at the time, there were something like over 40 million Americans who had a high school degree 
but who were not earning a living wage in the job market at the time. And, and when we actually began to interview these people, we realized that if we actually design an ecosystem around the biggest pain points that people are facing today, we can actually start to lift some of the barriers for all of us as we navigate these 20 or 30 job changes to come. And so many of the pain points kind of surfaced and coalesced around the need for better career navigation, understanding, you know, where I go right now with the skills that I bring to the table as a 35, a 45, a 55 year old worker, or even an 18 year old, right? Like, where am I today relative to where I want to go? How do I open the aperture of available pathways to me that maybe I didn't even know were within reach? And how do I get the right supports to kind of keep me accountable in that pathway? How do I find the kind of targeted learning that's available out of the over 967,000 credentials that are out there flooding our education and labor markets? How do we begin to kind of learn on the job so I don't have to forego my wages in order to uh, advance my education? And how do I get a fair shot? Like, how do I engage in sort of more fair and transparent hiring practices? And so it was kind of like an ecosystem built around these principles might make it easier for us to kind of um, access these more fluid on and on ramps in and out of um, education and work. And when I was thinking about Clayton's kind of talk of well-being and purpose, one of the things that, you know, has been striking to me in the research around kind of career pathways, both for working adults and for younger learners, is that we have seen that there's just so much guesswork that goes into career exploration today. Um, even with folks who are graduating with, with a liberal arts degree, we actually looked at the labor market analytics around this, and we saw that people with a liberal arts degree had a very successful and promising pathway ahead of them. It just took them three jobs to finally make it into a high wage, high skill, high demand career. And that's a lot of fumbling through work without actually knowing precisely the competencies you need to kind of build a path forward. Uh, the same goes for underemployment. We have high rates of underemployment. So it, it backs up our ability to kind of accumulate wealth over a lifetime, which also kind of all plays into uh, this, this, this idea of, do I feel a sense of purpose in my work? Do I feel connected and aligned to what I wanna be doing? And all of that ultimately kind of comes down to this larger point of exposure. And I think the guesswork is there because we don't provide enough exposure to our young learners for these opportunities for the future. We kind of only know what we know. We look to our social networks and ask them about jobs of the future. But if our social networks, if our families are limited in their understanding of the job market, then we will be equally kind of limited in how we think about what's available to us. And I happen to um, advise a nonprofit startup that helps first gen minority college goers kind of transition into a better first job. And what they realized is that people who have a, an exposure to greater than three or more industries with a kind of depth and an understanding of what those jobs entail have a sort of a 90% more likelihood of actually getting that first interview. And 100% of them who make that first interview actually go on to their second interview. And so it's this huge kind of opening of opportunities if we can kind of provide that greater um, view into what might be possible for them. And so that, that sense of purpose can arrive when we actually bring greater clarity, greater alignment, greater exposure, and then understand also internally what do my motivation, how do my motivations internally connect to that line of work? Am I seeking prestige? Am I seeking income? Am I seeking, you know, relationships? Is that pathway actually going to align with what I need in, currently in my life? These are all questions we have to kind of bring to the table for our younger learners. And that's all kind of coming from this research of understanding how stuck people are today and how we begin to kind of lift some of those, those pain points for people. Great, thank you, Michelle. That's that uh, really helpful and interesting perspectives. Peter, I, I mean, I don't even know where you want to go with what uh, Clayton and Michelle have been talking about, but why don't you weigh in, given the you know the enormity of your research and how you've been thinking about these issues around the sort of alignment around the future of work, our educational needs. How would you weigh in on this big question on you know this alignment with purpose? Yeah, Fran, it's such a joy to be here on this call with you and Clayton and Michelle. And I've been 
taking a lot of mental notes as I've listened to Clayton talk about the importance of the why, as I've been listening to Michelle talk about the importance of having opportunities to cycle through different career options so that you can find what it is that you care about. And, and this topic is very top of mind for me because as I advise students here at Harvard, and we have students coming from all over the world, from you know, Europe, from Africa, from the Middle East, from Asia, from the United States of America, that they're all seeking an opportunity to explore their why. They've all come here having written a personal statement and I've read many of them during my role as, as someone who's on the admissions committee here at Harvard, when I see them talking about the kinds of changes that they wanna see in their countries or in their communities. And it's inspiring that we as educators get to come alongside them and to help them to create an educational experience that allows them to live out in our classrooms their why so that when they go back to their context, they can begin to deploy some of those skills. I wanna talk, take a little detour and talk a little, a little bit personally. So I grew up in the Bahamas. I come from a very large family of six older brothers and I grew up selling fruits and vegetables in the Bahamas. And, you know, just like many people around the world, we were very working class and went to community college before I came to the U.S. And one of the things that was very pivotal for me, as I think about what Clayton said about understanding your why, was I had a pastor at the church that I went to who wrote a book on purpose, Dr. Miles Monroe. And so as a six-year-old kid, I kept hearing about purpose, understanding your purpose, understanding your potential. And for some people that's connected to certain spiritual practices that is for me. And that why is really critical because that why helps you to think and to dream about where, right? Um, and I had a brother who said to me, Peter, I can see you going to a school like a Stanford or a Harvard because you have the ability and the capacity to do that. Meanwhile, we were selling fruits and vegetables in the Bahamas, like staying in just like a single room. And so I want to say to our audience, which I know is very global, that no matter where you are, whether you're here in Cambridge or Harvard University, or you are in a rural village in some part of the world, that don't let your circumstances dictate your why, because your why is going to help you to figure out your where. And hopefully for some of you, your where will be Harvard. And I, I want to say to, in my capacity as an educator who teaches a class on the future of work and the future of education here at Harvard, and also someone who's done a lot of work on the population of, of, of folks who have completed high school but not completed college. This is a population that Michelle cares very deeply about as well. That a lot of it has to do with thinking about how do employers create pathways of mobility for workers who are coming with high school diplomas but not college degrees. In fact, a lot of the work that I've done in partnership with colleagues at Opportunity at Work, a nonprofit in Washington, DC, is to reframe the conversation on how we talk about this population of workers. In the United States alone, about 70 million workers out of the active workforce population of 140 million workers are whom we call STARS, skilled through alternative routes. They've completed high school, but not college. And the reason why we've been intentional in renaming that broad segment of the labor market in the United States is because for a very long time, academics have called workers who have college degrees as skilled workers and workers who don't have college degrees as unskilled. But many of you in the audience, you know that auntie, that grandma, that cousin who has not gone to college, but man, you put something in their hands and they can fix it, they can make it happen, they can get up in front of a room and they can hold a crowd and they are incredibly skilled. And so a lot of our work has been, has been focused on identifying the skills that people learn on the job. And we all learn skills on the job. Before I became a professor, I didn't know the ins and outs of how to teach. And so in a lot of ways, becoming a professor allowed me to be in the company of very distinguished colleagues from whom I learned the process of how to teach. And oftentimes the labor market functions in a way that creates barriers to entry for workers who don't have college degrees. And so we've been engaged in a campaign called Tear the Paper Ceiling where we want companies to think really critically about the ways in which they're requiring uh, college degrees. Because there are some jobs where you do want to require college degrees, but there are a lot of jobs where people can learn the same skills through their work experience. And if, you're, and if we are able to open up pathways for those workers to be considered based on their work experience, in the same way that a college educated worker can be considered based on their educational experience, then we can open up pathways to labor market mobility. And I'm, I'm really delighted to say that many companies in response to the work that we have done have opened up pathways for economic mobility for workers who are STARS. So I can think about Merck, for example, which Ken Fraser, one of our new board members at Harvard is a part of, he was a part of the 110 initiative that's opening up pathways to mobility for workers who are STARS. And so I wanna say that 
we have to think a lot about the, the pathways from the perspective of the individual workers as Michelle has been doing. And then we also have to say for companies, you have a whole talent pool of workers who are ready to work, who have relevant experience, but it's important that they're not screened up just because they didn't have the opportunity or the resources to go to college. They have the relevant skills, consider their work experience. Thanks, Peter. And I, I just had a, a few uh, questions coming in through, wanted me to repeat what star, well, would like you to repeat what STARS stands for. Can you say that again? Just uh, oh, So STARS, skilled through alternative routes, STARS. So instead of calling workers without college degrees unskilled, recognize that they have skills through their military experience, through their relevant work experience. Great. Thank you, Peter. So, so crucial. So, um, Clayton, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back to you, and then we're gonna go to our audience for some questions. But um, I would like to hear, and I think our audience would like to hear more about how at Bates you took the findings from that survey and created a, a program on the ground to help students, you know, with, with this alignment between their purpose and job seeking. So the main way we did it was to apply the same sort of commitment to really strong design and execution in the domain of making life choices and work as a big, big tranche of those life choices. Um, we didn't confuse tactics and strategy. People think a career center is about, we're plugged into a very great alumni network. We have great internships, but how do you run them? How do you do them? What are the sets of experiences we work with students on to make sure they understand that it is their set of commitments and what they bring to the table, to Peter's point. We, we don't run a precious little liberal arts program. We run a humanistic program that we can find human beings wherever they are, work with them and say, what matters to you? what you already know how do you to do, what are your strengths, what are your values, what are you seeking? And then in the context of the liberal arts experience, we ran a very high quality cohort-based um, internship program, we still do, um, in the Center for Purposeful Work. And we ask our students to come back from that internship program and many other kinds of programs to come back and they we have lunches all fall after the summer where they share their experiences according to what they learned, what they were seeking, what they expected. And just to give you an example, one of the most memorable talks I heard was from one of our students who was from LA, so a, a city kid, and all he wanted to do was work on a farm in Maine. He wanted, he all his life, he wanted to be a farmer. And he opened his reflection conversation uh, when he got back in the fall and said, well, I had this uh, internship on this farm up the road in Turner. It was absolutely beautiful. The animals were just the amazing. And I, this is what I learned from my internship. I never, ever, ever want to set foot on a farm again, as long as I live. So this was exposure, reflection, adaptation, move on. And this commitment to building what you seek in terms of your exposure from your interests, strengths, and values, and then reflecting on it, adapting, and moving on is a constant learning process that is going to A, work for anybody who's been in college or not, and B, allow you to move through the 35 jobs Michelle's going to give each of us by the time we um, collapse at the finish line with exhaustion. Um, but it, it's it's habits of mind, it's content knowledge, it's uh, cognitive skills, it's pragmatic skills, and it's the interpersonal abilities to be an agent of your own destiny throughout your life. Great. Thanks, Clayton. Um, so I have a, uh, a question from one of our audience members, and I think Michelle and Peter, I'm going to ask the two of you to weigh in on this a little bit. So it's uh, with the current anti-college climate we're facing uh, and the lack of trust in higher education, uh, we're seeing, we have been seeing enrollment drops in higher education. 
where students are more motivated to go into the workforce instead of college, how do we as educators assist these students in figuring out purpose and opening up social networks in order to find success in their career journey? And I would add, how do we better work with employers uh, in that same regard? So, um, Michelle, you wanna you wanna take a crack at that one? Sure. And you know, just this is a this is a tough question, uh, just because from a just from a pure financial perspective of outcomes, uh, when you do actually do decide to go to college and you actually make it through college. The outcomes are just far better than if you were not to go to college. So just from a financial perspective, you will earn, you know, on average anywhere from six hundred dollars to nine hundred thousand dollars over a lifetime more than someone without a high school degree. Um the the problem is a lot of people who maybe don't need to or don't or maybe can't make it through the college experience, don't make it through, like they don't graduate. And then you're worse off with that college debt and the inability to pay off that debt. Um, so for a lot of folks, it is important to understand that there are certain trades and areas and skilled skilled work areas where, you know, if you're going into certain allied health or fire, um, there are certain kinds of things where you're fixing people and things that actually you can get away with a certificate or certification at times, and you're better off than someone actually who's getting a, a four-year degree. So there are certain pathways that do exist that actually have those outcomes, not just one year out, but five, year out, five years out and 10 years out. There have been studies on this. The challenge is that a lot of people don't know what those pathways are. And so we need to do a better job as educators and counselors of helping people understand what those pathways look like. I think also just to kind of tack on to what Peter was mentioning around mobility pathways for the future, I think it's really important for someone who maybe is going to go directly into the workforce for them to actually look at that future employer and see if that employer actually has the long view on their talent development as a as an employee. It's really important. And I think, Peter, you've been part of this, this research on the project on workforce and managing the future of work where there's this American Opportunity Index idea of where are the employers that are actually enabling better mobility for people? Because once you actually get into a company, it's not always easy to understand how you progress and how you advance and how you get promoted. And so it's important for us to understand who are the employers that make that clearer, that make that more easily navigable for all of us. And if you can see that an employer actually does really value internal talent and building that talent on the job and building those skills, that's a place that you may want to think about as a as as a as a good place for you to to build skills, even if you're maybe not going to to get a degree. So it's also important from sort of that employer perspective and from you as an employee moving into the workforce to understand where will my future talent development emerge? Because it's not enough just what the skills I start out in the workforce are not the skills that I'm going to retire with. So who's going to actually help me build those skills? And it's important for some of those people to actually be able to see that in evidence of that kind of internal mobility within an employer. Yeah. All right, Peter, I'm going to, you get the last two minutes of our, uh, of our, of our web webinar today. So please wrap us up. Yeah, Michelle did such a great job making the pitch for alternative pathways. I'm gonna do like a little change up and make the pitch for, for college. We are broadcasting live from Harvard University, which is America's first college. And whenever people come to Harvard, I show them two things. I show them Mass Hall and I show them the plaque on it. And I show them that this is a place where George Washington during the Revolutionary War, his troops were battened up in that. This is a place that has produced lots of incredible research that has had a huge impact on the world in terms of reducing poverty, increasing access to life-saving medicines. And then I also show them the Widener Library and the Gutenberg Press, the Gutenberg Bible and the Widener Library. And so there's a very critical and foundational role that colleges and universities play in terms of educating our people, in terms of training folks who are going to be in our armed services, and in terms of maintaining democracy. And we are at a moment where there is a lot of skepticism and cynicism about universities. And I know that we at Harvard have especially faced a lot of criticism. And I would say to people who in this moment feel cynical or disappointed or despondent, 
that historically we have been a place of refuge for this country and for the world. And in the ways that we have, have messed up, we are sorry. And we want an opportunity to earn your trust because you've entrusted us with, with your kids. You've entrusted us with folks who are gonna be the future leaders. And one of the greatest privileges of my life is sitting in a classroom where I have students from Israel, from Saudi Arabia, from Palestine, from China, from India, from the, from the Midwest, from the Western parts of the United States, from the Northeast, from the South. And we get to build community in our classrooms. And I do believe fundamentally with every core of my being that one of the things that colleges are great for is bringing people together from different backgrounds, from different experiences. And I think that there's a lot of reparative work that we have to do to restore trust, but we have an ecosystem where we can begin to have those difficult conversations in our dining halls over meals, in our classrooms, in sections while we walk to the gym. And so I'm very bullish on the fact that colleges can make a comeback and that there's a very appropriate role for colleges and especially Harvard as the oldest college in the United States that we have to make in terms of, of making sure that there are pathways through college for folks, but also making sure that there are pathways for academic mobility for workers who may not have the opportunity or the resources to go to a four-year college. And I'm so grateful for the 800 people that have tuned in today from taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. And I hope that you tune in again. Thank you, Peter. Well, Peter, Clayton, Michelle, um, I feel like we could easily go on with this conversation for at least another hour or two or three. But alas, I'm gonna have to wrap us up. So thank you so much for joining us. Those of you in the audience, uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us and uh, hope you have a good rest of your, your day, your evening, your morning, wherever you happen to be. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you. now. Bye-bye. Thank you all.